This week on ANN, church leaders respond to the Zika virus global health emergency. The Seventh-day Adventist Church in the Southern Asian Pacific region expresses gratitude for the support it received after the recent deaths of two leaders. And in honor of World Cancer Day, hear a moving testimony from a cancer survivor. These stories and more coming up. This is ANN, a service of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church. Thanks so much for joining us this week. First in the news, on February 1, the World Health Organization, the public health arm of the United Nations, declared the Zika virus a public health emergency of international concern. Outbreaks of the virus have been reported all throughout Central and South America and currently pose the biggest threat to unborn fetuses. The Zika virus is spread through mosquito bites and the most common symptoms include fever, rashes, joint pain and red eyes. However, recent reports in Brazil showed that approximately 4,000 women who contracted the virus while they were pregnant gave birth to babies with underdeveloped brains, which is a condition known as microcephaly. Due to the outbreak, the Center for Disease Control has issued travel notices for countries in the Caribbean, Central America and South America. Dr. Peter Landless, Director of Health Ministries for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, has more on what this means for the international community and what steps people can take to keep the virus from spreading. What can people do internationally and people who travel? The thing to do is to have preventive measures, use insect repellent, at dawn and dusk keep sleeves down, and roll down so that the arms and the legs are not bare for the mosquitoes. And those are the times they come in except the uh, Aedes aegypti, the mosquito which is the vector for um, Zika, it feeds at all times of the day. So people have to be careful. Um, getting rid of mosquitoes is very important and using insect repellent has to be done. And of course, for the pregnant mother should not travel to Zika areas and seek advice before traveling to make sure. And Marcelo Niek, Director of Health Ministries for the Seventh-day Adventist Church in South America, has more on the importance of sharing factual information about the virus. Muitas pessoas têm prestado um grande desserviço à saúde pública propagando boatos, falsas notícias e até mesmo informações danosas à saúde das pessoas. Existe hoje um verdadeiro exército de médicos, bioquímicos, farma farmacologistas, cientistas de toda forma estudando, debruçando-se sobre esse desafio. E eu posso dizer para você que quem faz a boa ciência tem uma certeza e uma convicção. O Zika vírus é uma doença infecciosa que está se tornando presente em todo o nosso país e, segundo a OMS, vai se espalhar em todo o continente americano, com exceção da, do Chile e da, do Canadá. E esta doença não tem nada a ver com a vacina da rubéola, com mecanismos de medicamento vencido, com uma teoria da conspiração de um governo. Até o momento, nós só temos uma certeza, que esta é uma batalha não dos governos, não das instituições, mas de cada um de nós. Então vamos fazer a nossa parte, divulgando a boa informação, prevenindo a multiplicação do mosquito nos focos de água limpa e parada, que é onde ele se reproduz, eliminando recipientes, caixas d'água que estão expostas, etc., e nos prevenindo contra as picadas. The Seventh-day Adventist Church in the Southern Asian Pacific region issued a message of appreciation in response to the outpouring of support after the recent deaths of two leaders. The territory's previous president, Alberto Goldfund Jr., passed away in September 2015, while its most recent president, Leonardo Assoy, passed away on January 12. Goldfund battled with multiple myeloma, and Assoy succumbed to the effects of myelitis plastic syndrome, or MDS. The statement says, quote, We are especially grateful for the caring and support from our world church and its administration during this time. Through prayers, phone calls, emails, and other encouragement, you have touched our hearts. This was most recently exemplified in World Church President Ted Wilson's suggestion of a special time of remembrance for our two faithful leaders." End quote. 
Visit news.adventist.org to read the full statement. Thursday, February 4 was World Cancer Day, which is an initiative of the Union for International Cancer Control. The theme for this year is We Can, I Can. People around the world were encouraged to do their part to reduce the global burden of cancer. So in honour of World Cancer Day, Loma Linda University Health sent this report. For nine years I was a stay-at-home mom and uh, I did everything from PTA to mommy and me, um, anything and everything that involved the children. Up until uh, my husband got laid off um, and I was happy that I was healthy enough at the time to go out and help the family out. I had about three different jobs at one point, working up to 75 hours a week. In June of 2011, I found out uh, that we were expecting baby number four, which was a, a huge blessing. About a month after that, I had gone in for a physical and uh, I got a, a phone call. It was actually um, on my birthday, I believe it was. I had just turned uh, 32 and the doctor said, you do in fact have breast cancer. Uh, so you go from being excited that you know, you're know you gonna have a brand new baby and uh, the excitement turns to uh, worry at the same time. But at that point, I didn't know if I was you know, even gonna get to keep the baby. We got sent over to Loma Linda, ended up having the mastectomy right at my three month mark. If I didn't have the mastectomy, there would be a good chance that I wouldn't be alive. Uh, to even see the baby. And exactly six weeks out of that, uh, I started chemo. And I was on chemo until I was um, 32 weeks pregnant. And I uh, was told uh, by the oncologist that if my body didn't, and the baby as well, didn't have exactly at least the bare minimum of four weeks out of chemo, uh, that it could be deadly for both of us uh, because our immune systems were compromised. We were uh, praising God when we hit the 36 week mark and Chase was born um, December 31st, so it's a New Year's Eve baby. Um, I told the kids that every year uh, the entire world will celebrate his birthday, but they just don't know they're celebrating his birthday. <laughs> He's our miracle baby. He's such a huge blessing to, to our entire family, especially after all that we went through. We all uh, needed something to give us hope. <laughs> then February of 2012, uh, I had the right breast removed and they went in uh, and took all the lymph nodes out of the left breast uh, at the same time. And they gave me almost exactly six weeks, again, <laughs> recovery out of that one uh, to start radiation. And God has been so good through it all. Their goal was to cure me uh, and not just treat me. So as of right now, I am cancer free. <laughs> the diagnosis uh, was actually a blessing in disguise. It had uh, allowed me to slow down and really focus on what was important in life. I find the most enjoyment that the kids um, from helping them with their homework to uh, riding horses to watching them play in the yard. Um, I, I love every moment with them. Once you're faced with possibly not having them and the thought that you know they might not have their mommy, it really tends to make you reprioritize just how important everything is. To me, life in general is uh, what I celebrate every day waking up from the, the air that we breathe to changing diapers. I mean, it all becomes uh, enjoyable. <laughs> the things that I think a lot of people uh, take for granted on an everyday basis. I celebrate every, every moment of every day. The insurance company of the Seventh-day Adventist Church this week released resources for an upcoming event to encourage local churches to be prepared for worst-case scenarios. Adventist Risk Management Safety Sabbath is set for March 26, but churches are welcome to also select any other Sabbath in the month of March. With ARM's resources, local churches can have everything they need to hold their own emergency drills, including missing child, 
active shooter, and fire drills. Anna Barlett, writer and education specialist for Adventist Risk Management, has more on why churches should participate. A question all church members and leaders should ask is, is our church ready? This means ready for any emergency situation. What would your congregation do if an active shooter walked into your sanctuary? Do your children know what to do if they get lost or if someone attempts to abduct them? What if there's a fire? Could everyone exit safely? Holding annual practice drills prepares your church family to respond to emergency situations in the safest way possible. This is the goal of the annual Safety Sabbath. That's why Adventist Risk Management is encouraging every church to hold a safety drill during the month of March. Visit safetysabbath.com to find free resources to hold your own active shooter drill, missing child drill, or church fire drill. You'll find emergency drill guides, cool posters, resources for children, and much more at safetysabbath.com. The governor of Mexico's most populous state recently pledged his support for the Adventist Church's efforts in religious liberty and social programs. Irreveal Avila Villegas, governor of the state of Mexico, affirmed the work of the denomination in a private meeting with Ganun Diop, director of public affairs and religious liberty for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The governor said, quote, I want you to know that you have an ally in the government of Mexico. The governor thanked Diop for his worldwide work in safeguarding religious freedom, and he described him as a man, quote, who promotes peace and who develops alliances to do good and to support those who need it most, end quote. In turn, Diop expressed gratitude to the governor for his continuing support for religious freedom as a fundamental and universal human right. The meeting was held the day before the beginning of the first Adventist-sponsored Religious Liberty Congress to be held in Mexico City. During the Congress, more than 200 people, including students, professionals, and local church pastors were encouraged to continue expressing their gratitude for religious liberties as they work to make these freedoms even more clearly reflected within Mexican society. The Seventh-day Adventist Church in Southern England recently gave the green light for Adventist media centers in the territory to increase British-based production for the church's official broadcast network in the UK. This means Hope Channel UK will be able to create its own channel instead of having to solely depend on programs from Hope Channel International. The network will be able to air targeted programming for local viewers during primetime hours in Britain. Hope Channel UK has more. I've been working in Adventist media for over 30 years now and it's wonderful to see things developing and this is now the latest stage. We've had Hope Channel as a presence in the British Union for over 10 years. We've got a brilliant on-demand service and that's growing every day. And this part now means that we will also have a live stream developing so you can just press a button and you can watch the best of British and international Hope Channel programming directly on your screen, through your Roku box, through Samsung TVs, on your computer, shortly through Apple and Amazon Fire. There's different ways that you will be able to share the good news of Jesus, solid Adventist messages through this brand new initiative. The first Seventh-day Adventist school in the Southeast Asian country of Timor-Leste is in urgent need of teachers. When the Timor-Leste Adventist International School opened its doors in September 2015, its presence generated a surge of enthusiasm throughout the community. The school offers an incremental growth plan with an English preparatory class, kindergarten and first grade. Second grade will be added next school year and approximately two grades will be added each year afterward as needed until TAIS is a complete secondary school. With continued growth expected, TAIS will face a shortage of teachers next year. The school needs two or three new teachers to help cover all the classes. If you are willing to serve as a student missionary for TAIS, visit AdventistVolunteers.org, click Long Term, then Search Calls, then select from East Timor. Coming up, learn about a clean water initiative in Sri Lanka. I can't remember a time in my life when I wasn't dating a guy or interested in wine. And this is where I got my security from as a woman. This is what filled the void in my life. I prayed about it and I said, God, I need your help. My happiness goes up and down with the ups and downs of my relationship. It's dependent upon 
upon how well my relationship is doing, and I don't want to live this way anymore. Welcome back. Every year, millions of people die from the effects of water-related diseases. The Adventist Development and Relief Agency in Sri Lanka, with monetary support from ADRA UK, is seeking to address this issue in the nation's Anurad Hapura district. ADRA Sri Lanka has more. Water is an essential part of life. Accessibility to clean water is a privilege that 783 million people in the world do not have. Research done by the UN has shown around 6 to 8 million people die annually from consequences of disasters and water-related diseases. While Sri Lanka is home to an abundance of water sources, there are many areas that do not have access to clean water and the Anuradhapura district is no exception. It is a known fact that the consumption of unclean water causes many sicknesses and has a direct effect on people's lives. Education is disrupted, economic development is challenged and overall causes many problems for families, communities and to the country. Adding to the issues surrounding the lack of clean water is the fact that the Anuradhapura district has a very high number of people that have fallen ill to kidney diseases. According to a research done by the World Health Organization, more than 15% of the population aged 15 to 70 years in the North Central and the Uwa province carry chronic kidney diseases. While the phenomenon is known as chronic kidney disease of unknown origin, it is a widely accepted fact that pollutants in the water consumed by communities causes this grave issue. It is into this setting that Adra Sri Lanka entered the Anuradhapura district with the Gift Water Project. Funded by Adra UK, the project introduced a novel concept of water purification and distribution for the first time in Sri Lanka. Through the Gift Water Project, Adra Sri Lanka established seven community water dispensers in communities that had a dire need for clean water and had many people affected by the chronic kidney disease. The community water dispensers are special units that purify water using the reverse osmosis technology. Since the water sources for these community water dispensers are deep bore wells, the chances of the water being polluted is almost zero. The project has taken extensive measures to ensure that the water source and the water purification system is safe from pollutants at all times. And finally in the news this week, on the Caribbean island of St. Thomas, a cafe operated by the Seventh-day Adventist Church has become a hot spot at a popular shopping mall. The cafe only has one item on the menu, prayer. At the prayer cafe, which is open daily, Guests can either place written prayers in a prayer box or ask for someone to pray with them right in the cafe. If people aren't able to physically make it to the cafe, volunteers also take prayer requests via the telephone. According to the cafe's owner, Mill Robinson, more than 200 people have visited the cafe since it opened on January 18. For more than three years, Robinson has envisioned a prayer ministry that could offer hope in a community that's affected by violence. When individuals come with their prayer needs, they hear soft Christian music playing, get a chance to talk to someone about their needs, and receive encouragement through prayer, says Robinson. She went on to say, quote, People have commented how soothing it is to visit, how they can sense the presence of the Holy Spirit, and have said they don't want to leave because they feel the presence of God. Coming up, communicators and technology experts are gearing up to meet for the church's annual tech conference. But up next, learn how laughter is indeed good medicine, especially for your brain. Every hour spent watching TV may shorten the viewer's life by 21.8 minutes. 
New research published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine tracked data from 100,000 Australians over the age of 25. They found that those who watch six hours a day can expect to live 4.8 years less than a person who does not watch TV, and concluded that watching too much TV is as dangerous as smoking or being overweight. That's a fact. But there's hope. You can extend your life expectancy by the push of a button, the TV remote button, that is. Consider alternative forms of relaxation and entertainment that reduce sedentary time and introduce more physical activity to your family's daily life. So don't wait. Turn off the TV and live a healthier and longer life. Welcome back. In this week's Live It episode from Loma Linda University Health, learn how laughter can help improve short-term memory. Ever forget where you put your keys? Or maybe that one word is at the tip of your tongue, but you just can't remember it? Short-term memory loss can be a common occurrence, especially when we're stressed out. This is no laughing matter, or is it? Loma Linda University Health researchers have found that when we're stressed, our cortisol levels increase. Cortisol is a stress hormone, and when it enters the hippocampus of our brain, it can damage neurons that are involved with learning and memory. Dr. Gurinder Baines studied short-term memory in the elderly population by giving memory tests. The only difference between the two groups were that half of them watched a 20-minute funny video that made them laugh, as opposed to the non-humor group who just sat in the waiting room. After the experiment, the humor group had significantly decreased cortisol levels compared to those who just sat and didn't watch a funny video. As it turns out, short-term memory is a laughing matter. When we laugh, the stress hormone cortisol decreases and thus our short-term memory will improve. If we can make ourselves more healthy as we take a whole person approach in that aspect and we can decrease our stress levels, all of that can actually lead to a better quality of life. Being able to look forward to doing something enjoyable also reduces stress. If you're in a stressful situation, you can actually be thinking, oh, you know what, I'm going to be doing something fun with my family, you know, I'm going to work out, it's going to relieve some stress. That can actually help with um, cortisol levels and stress. What are the tips for the day? Lower your stress levels by laughing more. You can watch comedies, socialize with friends, plan to do something you enjoy after work. And for those who are grandparents, spend time with your grandkids. The little ones can always make us laugh. There is your tip for the day on how you can live healthier, longer. To find out more about Live It, Loma Linda University Health's new online health show, and to watch past episodes, visit liveitlomalinda.org. The Adventist Church's Global Adventist Internet Network Conference is around the corner. Brent Harding, web manager for the denomination, has more. We're only weeks away from the annual Global Adventist Internet Network Conference. Communicators and technologists from around the world are preparing to share and learn how to better use technology for mission. We're excited about the 2016 conference with a great list of new and experienced voices lined up to share with this year's attendees. The theme of the conference, Telling Our Story in a Rapidly Changing World, invites attendees to explore new ways to think about mission and how we reach the world around us. Speakers include Ashley Isley and Erica St. Louis, who tell how ADRA is using digital campaigns to build a bigger reach. Kevin Ames from The Voice of Prophecy, sharing some simple steps that they took to dramatically increase traffic to their websites. Designer Daniel Mall will talk about how design is used to influence for good. And Chan Min Chung will share how he uses storytelling in the Middle East. And this list is just scratching the surface. We have planned three days of presentations from some of the best speakers. The conference will be held in Silver Spring, Maryland at the world headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, February 24 through 27. And this year, we are offering new options for registering that include single day passes for those not able to attend the whole event. So go to gain 
.adventist.org, that's G-A-I-N .adventist.org, to see a complete list of speakers and to register. You don't want to miss this exciting communication training event. And finally for today's program, let's turn to David Trim for a look at Adventist history. This week, learn about the organization of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Mexico. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History. On February 1, 1960, in Port of Spain, the capital of the island nation of Trinidad and Tobago, construction began on the Community Hospital of Seventh-day Adventists. Here you see the hospital's main building as it looked just after it opened. Today, it's a 45-bed hospital that treats around 12,500 patients annually. On February 2 and 3 in 1861, the first meeting of Adventists from across the U.S. state of Minnesota was held in the small town of Pleasant Grove. Church members traveled as far as 100 miles to, as one wrote, take into consideration the wants of the cause in this new state. Plans were laid for concerted outreach across the state, and money was raised to buy a big tent with which later in the year John N. Andrews conducted evangelistic meetings in Minnesota and northern Iowa. And eight months later, in October 1861, Minnesotan Seventh-day Adventists organized the Minnesota Conference, building on the two-day meeting held 155 years ago this week. And during this week, 86 years ago, the Mexico Union was organized at a nearly week-long meeting, February 2 through 6, in 1926. Six local missions in the country of Mexico, comprising 29 local churches with 718 members, were separated from what had been called the Aztec Union into a separate union. An American missionary, Daniel A. Parsons, seen here when he was a missionary in England, became the first superintendent of the Mexico Union. Meanwhile, missions in Guatemala, Salvador, Honduras, and British Honduras were formed into the Central American Union mission. Today, there are five unions in Mexico with some 700,000 church members. That was this week in Adventist history. Thanks for watching ANN. Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In the meantime, join our global conversation on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can connect with Adventists worldwide through more stories, photos, and videos. Visit Facebook slash Adventist News, Twitter at Adventist Church, and Instagram at Adventist Church. Our good news for this week comes from the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 16. The passage says, For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through Him and for Him. That's our program for this week. And remember, you can always visit news.adventist.org for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care.